Al-Khalifa. In our speech as well as in our writings. For? In, for the word Huzur. The Khalifa or the... Khalifa is the rule used in everyday life, everywhere. Perhaps you are not aware of it. I mean, uh, the, when used, we used to receive publications uh, talking about your activities here, in our circle. Even, even there, the word Khalifa is always used. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. It's, it's, like it's always it's, used. Yes. Only yes. yes. perhaps... Uh, many times Huzur instead of it, until our people used to ask, what, what does the word Huzur mean? Uh, this is perhaps because the people who have been talking to you there, have been using it uh, uh, themselves. I mean, this is their own choice of words, not uh, the practice of Jamaat Ahmadiyya. In Jamaat Ahmadiyya, when you have to repeatedly make a mention, a reference to someone, then sometimes the original title, the real title, is not repeated every time. So, as a sort of Isme Zameer, the word Huzur or Aap or other words are used. But uh, that the real title given to the head of the Ahmadiyya community uh, by Ahadrat Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself because he said Summat Takuno Khilafatun Ala Min Hajin Nabuwa that means the whole system of Khilafat will be unfolded to continue so this is his title who can take away this title and uh, this is used by uh, Ahmadis everywhere in the world so that is, uh, the, for the first, the word Khalifa is used. Later on, in the continuation of the same reference, uh, not every time the word Khalifa is used, but some other word, a word of reference, easy reference, uh, is used instead of Khalifa, in the following references, I mean. If you would permit me, I will Ask take this opportunity to yes. uh, uh, talk about my deep uh, gratefulness to all our brothers here. In fact, I, this is the first time I experience living in a piece of real heaven. With, Alhamdulillah, uh, I am very happy. Yes. Uh, this is a compliment to the whole community and uh, I return this compliment to you on behalf of everybody. Yes. And on behalf of the Amish side of, of England as well. Alhamdulillah, we are very happy that you are carrying back such wonderful impressions of the community. Just Allah bless you. And may Allah create the same atmosphere as peace and Jannah among the Ahmad Syrian Ahmadis. Yes. <coughs> Won't it be better for the leading religious scholars of both sides to get together and discuss openly the differences between themselves for the enlightenment of ordinary people. Yes. Thank you. The dialogues have been held, held right from the start. Prophet Masimul himself started the dialogue. His, his dialogue is published by the greatest scholars of that time. But later on, he abstained from um, going into dialogue with others because those people who invited him first for dialogue ultimately started using it to, for creating mischief and trouble and disorder. And uh, despite that opportunity given to them that the, the uh, Imam himself was ready to present his case to the most important religious leadership of that time, they misused that occasion and uh, tried to, always it ended up into abuse and invectives, one-sided uh, edits of uh, um, kufr against him and uh, incitement to people to kill him and so on. So it proved to be futile ultimately. So Hazrat Masih Mawala declared in the end that no more of these debates because they have gone, be gone beyond the limitations of debates as uh, um, mature people should uh, uh, should conceive what a debate is. I mean, beyond the boundaries of sensible, civilized debate. But it never ended there. 
as far as the other ulama of Ahmadiyyat are concerned, other scholars of Ahmadiyyat, they have been continuously engaged in such debates, particularly during the pre-partition days. Great munasras, as they were called, were held in those days between the scholars of one community and the scholars of the others. But the most interesting fact, which is to be noted by you, is this, that those debates, the accounts of those debates, was published by Ahmadis and never by the opponents. We can still find those books in which Hazrat Musim of the Lassalatu Aslam um, uh, went into a dialogue with a non Ahmadi scholar and or a lesser Ahmadi, uh, this is another scholar of Ahmadi, had went into dialogue with other Ahmadis. Now, why this strange thing that Hazrat Musim of the Lassalatu Aslam publishes that account word for word but the other party does not? An Ahmadi scholar publishes that account word for, uh, for word, but the other party does not. Because they do, do not want their people to know what passed between them. This is a proof of their weakness. Their, this is a proof also of their dishonesty. If a dialogue was to be held, it was to be held for a purpose. It should have been meaningful dialogue. And why are you keeping your own people away from the contents of that dialogue? So all the books of Munazaraz held by Hazrat Musim of the Salaam are still available, published by Ahmadiyya community. And none of these books is ever published by our opponents. The Munazaraz held between Mawli Abulata Sahib, the late Mawlana Abulata Sahib and others by Mawlana Shambh Sahib and others, Kazi Muhammad Nazir Sahib and others, and so on. Mahafuz Roshan Ali Sahib and other Tafiz, other Mawiraji Sahib and so on. All these accounts are recorded and published by Ahmadis and if the Ahmadis had been defeated, it should have been the other way around. Our opponents should have published the accounts and Ahmadis should have written it. But not to go that far back in history, I now bring your attention to a recent happening. A debate was actually held, in fact a sort of debate, in the National Assembly prior to, declare us to be, declaring us to be non-Muslims. It went on for 14 days. My predecessor, Hazrat Khalifa Tulmusi Salis, represented the case of Jamaat Ahmadiyya together with a few Ahmadi scholars whom he had chosen to help him. But he himself was the only spokesman. And on the other hand, all the very cream of non ahmadi society was present in National Assembly. And the whole department of, of religious affairs of government of Pakistan was at their back. And the entire department of law was at their back to help them. They were open day and night, all these offices, and they helped them. A dialogue was held. Why don't they publish it? This is what you want. This is exactly what you need. That a dialogue not only should be held, but should be made public, available to everybody. They should judge who is right and who is wrong. And a dialogue is already there, but the government insists that it will not be published. It prohibits Ahmadis on pain of punishment. That if you publish it, we'll uh, prosecute you. Why? <laughs> the same weakness. I mean, they have accepted defeat. Why to talk of force? Why to talk of souls? Putting people to death? Burning somebody's houses? This is a defeat. Defeat of logic. Which uh, compels others to have recourse to such violent actions. This has again been in complete conformity with the opponents of messengers of God. The same behavior is so visible, so obvious, that the same man, if he wants to study the right and wrong, it is so plainly written, written on the walls, that uh, I am really wonder how one can miss it. <coughs> yes? Assalamu alaikum. Wa Zura, I was uh, going to request uh, uh, for some 
you to kindly throw some light uh, on Syria. That reminded him. Yes. But before I make that re particular request, uh, the answer which you gave to the previous questioner with regard on to the question of music, one before the previous question yes, about the debate. Yes. If you kindly permit me, I'll just make one observation. Small observation about that. Uh, there is a document, an official document, in which uh, not exactly the debate itself, but the explanations by Ahmadi scholars and Ahmadi leaders, as well as by non-Ahmadi uh, scholars yes. and their leaders, exists that document. It's an official document called the Report on Disturbances, disturbances in 1953 the Munir committee reports are, which... Uh -huh, uh, but that is uh, not exactly what he had in mind, what Dr. Saib had uh, in mind. That's quite right, sir. That's yes, what yes, I yes, said. Yes, it's yes. not exactly a debate, but uh -huh, it but, does... But an official record of how the how differences were uh, <laughs> attempted to be resolved... To be resolved. And is, then is, is what I would yes. like to draw his attention yes. is the conclusion by the court itself, by Justice Munir, in which he has very clearly and very unequivocally, he has uh, given remarks about all these uh, non Ahmadi scholars and uh, their total failure to, to bring about any rational uh, uh, explanation of uh, the positions which they had held with regard to Ahmadis and with regard to Ahmadiyat. So this was uh, yes. only an observation. You know, I, I also attended a few sessions some uh, once, uh, not only once, many times, some very numerous situations arose because uh, both the judges of that court, Justice Munir as well as Justice Kiani, had a very refined sense of humor, which they would always intermingle with their decisions and uh, appropri appropriate remarks. So once uh, the non these <coughs> plotted uh, a very interesting um, plot against Hazrat Khalifa al Masihani's appearance in court. While he was to appear in court, they had created a witness who was to declare in the court that he was the donkey of Antichrist, the Jal. And uh, they had planned that uh, the moment he would declare he is the donkey of the Jal, one of the ulama's uh, advocates would ask him the pointed question, well, all right, do you recognize the Dajjal? And he would say, yes, he's the Dajjal and so on and so forth. You are his donkey and he recognized the Dajjal. So the court would have a good laughter against Ahmadis and at Ahmadis and so on. So Justice Munir and Kiani were a very sharp-witted people. They immediately detected that Hazrat Khalilat Masihani had uh, arrived and now there in his presence was that antichrist, antichrist donkey, so-called donkey. He was already on, 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 otherwise he was the same man, only he was posing for that, creating that particular mischief. So <coughs> I was also there. Justice Munir asked him, well, I understand, Mr. So-and-so, that you are the donkey of the Dajjal. He said, yes, I am the donkey. He said, then you must recognize him. Look at the back rows where the Malvis were sitting. <laughs> <laughs> Look at them and recognize which of them is the Antichrist. <laughs> so the whole hall burst into laughter. <laughs> the table was turned against them, you know. That report is a very interesting study. Apart from its being a, a question of who was right or who was wrong, it's, apart from its, its uh, uh, um, employment in deciding the question, I mean, as a literary piece, it's a wonderful report. The judiciary was at its highest at the time of such people as Justice Munir and uh, Justice Kayani, etc. Very capable people, completely free from all other interferences and uh, also very sharp-witted and, um, you know, 
who had a very deep knowledge of their trade. So if you report or study the, their verdicts, not only in this case, but in other cases as well, you'll find uh, it a very interesting and very enlightening study. We have got a copy here available. If you have, you can provide, provide him with that. Have you read the book of Justice Munir uh, from Qaid Azam to Martial Law? From, from Jinnah to Martial Law. From I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm from Jinnah to Martial Law. Yeah, that's right, yes. All the martial laws in between are described. I, I read it uh, about when the, the, it was first it published. Uh, out of the very first few copies, one was sent to me, and I found it a very interesting study. It was brave enough to criticize the government, of the then government, in such clear terms, without any fear of reprisal. And that also is a very good book. It has a very kind reference to Ahmadiyyat in that book. So, are there questions, please? Ah, yes, you have? If you permit me, where, where is I, Mr. I, Rashid, Abdul Rashid? You still as are you here? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I would kindly request you to to give your opinion views on uh, Syria because uh, the presence of our brother it has been a great pleasure and a great honor for us to have him with us. Uh, about 30 years ago, uh, when Hazrat. Uh, Khalif Asani, we are lovely pleased with him when he was here. I remember one evening uh, uh, he had called me and he was discussing his tour program for Europe and for the Middle East. And uh, Syria, Damascus, uh, came under discussion. And uh, he uh, made a, a very far sighted statement. He said, uh, This is the place from where much good has come and uh, from where much evil may also come. Uh, two days ago I was uh, reading an American magazine in which the American political experts were predicting that uh, the next big holocaust, the next war might start from Syria. So I wonder whether Yes, I'll, 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 this is a very interesting uh, question you have raised and I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to <coughs> express my views on this subject. First of all, the importance of Syria. In the Manarat in Baidwa, Sharqiya Damashq. So that means that Damascus has to play a very important role in the time when Messiah would reappear in the latter days. That role is made clear to us by Hazrat Masih Maud himself in light of certain, certain revelations made to him about Syria. Number one, the goodness of Syria is expressed in the Ilham where some of the Syrian people are described by Allah as Abdal sham Abdal is a term of Islam, later, day, later term, not the Quranic or term or the term of Huzur Akram Wasallam, but a term which was coined later on by the Sufis. Abdal stands next in order to Qutb, which is the highest spiritual authority other than the prophets, which can exist at any time in the world. 
at one time they say there is just one Qutb whether it's right or wrong but that is the order of Qutb and next to the order of Qutb comes Abdal so Abdal to, to, for Allah to, to call some people of Syria to be Abdal that's the most wonderful verdict which could be issued in favor of Syrian people even if there are a few Abdal among Syrians of course there would be many because Allah mentioned this fact that's the greatest compliments that you could receive but that is only one side the other revelation of Hazrat Masih which is mentioned in Tazkara deals with the future holocaust of the world and Hazrat Masih is reported to have told that the next great calamity or a great world calamity would uh, befall all the humanity which will have its close connection with Syria it will originate from Syria, it will start from Syria so I am really surprised that the present day um, strategists have also expressed their opinion now after about a hundred years from the declaration of Hazrat Masih Maud at that time nobody could believe that Syria could play any role in the world holocaust in the occurrence of such great uh, um, I mean global nature Syria could play any role I mean this was unthinkable at that time yet Hazrat Masih Maud was told that Syria would play a key role in the unfolding of events which will lead to the world calamity so you have uh, read this in which paper or which art which, which magazine you you send me uh, a copy of that or a photo state of that I want that to be published in just opposition to this prophecy of Hazrat Masih and that would be in, in itself to believe enough people would judge for themselves what sort of uh, messenger of Allah he was a hundred years from now before us before this time he is declaring without any signs being there that Syria will be will be, play the key role in the future calamity of the world and here now in the present circumstances in the present events of the world the seers the political seers have started saying the same thing so before that happens you detect who the Abdal are there must be potential Abdal in Syria everywhere those Abdal have not been conveyed the message of Hazrat Masih Maud this is why they remain as potential Abdal they would become active Abdal and they would rise to the surface when they are conveyed the message so it's very important that you should activate your preaching uh, preaching in Syria in a revolutionary manner at present you are you know you are in a state of slumber almost the entire community is sleeping rise and realize your position how, what Allah expects of you and Abdal you know is a person who has shed light all around he is not a solitary person he has exerted his influence over large areas so unless there are Ahmadis in Syria who have benefited large communities in Syria they can't be called Abdal Abdal is not just a hidden status given by Allah Abdal, an Abdal is a person who exerts wide influence of beneficence around the, around the society and all, all around him I mean in the society so an Abdal has to prove his case some people in Syria, I know, believe them to be Abdal, the very object of this ilham, because they think they are pious. 
piety in itself does not create an abdal an abdal has to be a mujahid of a high order an abdal has to exert a wider influence and win over converts from all sides then only and only then he will rise to that status of abdal in the sight of Allah <coughs> that is not what is happening potentially I know there would be many abdal living here and there maybe among Ahmadis as well and among non-Ahmadis undetected so far but I want them to be detected to be turned into active abdals rather than a slumbering potent abdal Yes, please. The question was that everybody thinks that the Islamic Pan? Again? It just wasn't that can be truthful and that is Emily. Well, why is it? It's only popular in this country like Pakistan and not other countries like Saudi Arabia, which is a main country that they should um, believe in the promised Messiah. You know, I understand the point. My answer is that whenever we discuss such questions, we want to resolve an issue. The safest policy would be first to refer to the Holy Quran and take a light from the Holy Quran itself. Whenever these issues are debated among Muslims, what should one do? The Holy Quran tells us, فَإِذَا تَنَازَاتٌ فِي شَيْنٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Either you will find the answer in the Holy Quran itself or an explanation of the, of the Holy Quran's verdict in the words of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa And uh, every possible riddle that you may face anywhere, anytime in future would be solved effectively and correctly by these two sources the Holy Quran and the Prophet of Islam that is his word, the tradition so on this no Muslim can differ so let's start from this now when the time of dif differences comes between Muslims and so that they are divided into various sects what should happen at that time? shall we find the truth equally divided between all and falsehood as well equally divided between all and try to choose the pieces of truth from here and there and there and turn them into one whole or something else would happen this is the main issue is it possible for one sect at that time to claim that the truth belongs to that sect and the rest are all wrong or in the wrong this is the issue in debate so why not turn to Huzur Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam according to the statement of the Holy Quran and find the answer from him and we find an answer which exactly fits the situation exactly as if the answer is made to measure Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is known to have stated one time that a time would come when my ummah my people would be divided into 72 sects like the Jews were divided into 72 sects but they will not only be divided into 72 sects they would be a 73rd jamaa this would be the extent of their mutual differences 72 sects as against the 72 sects of the Jews in the latter days of the Jewish era and a 73rd Jamaat what would happen then? the verdict was kulluhum finnare illa wahidatan wahel jamaat all of them would be hellish only one would be heavenly and that would be the 73rd Jamaah the issue has already been solved <laughs> by Hazrat Aghdus Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself that at the time of division of Muslims 
do not seek truth piecemeal here and there scattered all over the horizon but go for one particular jama'ah which according to this verdict of Hazur Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be in the right path and the rest would be in the wrong this is in other words what declared so why wonder if Jamaat Ahmadiyya claims to be that Jamaat every sect has a right to claim to be that Jamaat so every sect must claim that he is the only sect which is in the right and all the rest are wrong because if they claim no the truth is divided between us then they would be declaring something against the verdict of Ahazur sallallahu alayhi wa so if a believer in a sect is honest he has to succumb totally and submit entirely to the will of Ahazur sallallahu alayhi wa and follow his verdict his verdict is that if you are honest you must believe that only one sect is in the right that is called Jama'ah and the rest of the Muslim sects are in the wrong so after that the debate seems to have ended already but it did not end up there when Azra sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first declared this one of the present at that time he asked a question which was uh, a, 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 a logical conclusion to this he said, Ya Rasulullah, how shall we recognize the Jama'ah from among the 73? What a difficult question. The Muslims are divided into 73 sects according to me, he understood rightly that everybody would be claiming to be that Jama'ah, of course. How would people of the time understand, detect the correct Jama'ah as against the wrong sects? This is the million dollar question or a billion or as much as you please. And the, apparently if you ask the same question to a mullah who doesn't know the answer of Ahuza Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will be bogged down, he will not be able to answer this question. It's very difficult. Even more difficult than the question that here are 73 eggs and 72 are, are bad eggs only one is the right one pick up the right one and you have to pick up the right one or you will go to hell <laughs> this is the order and the question is how to find the right egg <laughs> you see and the answer seems to be so complicated an ordinary person of ordinary knowledge has not time enough to investigate into his own to the beliefs of his own sect he neither has the capability nor the time and so on and even if he is the greatest scholar of his time he has not the capability and time to thoroughly investigate all the 72 sects of Islam with the history of hundreds of years behind them so how can you solve this question academically it's impossible but look at the beauty of the answer of Hazrat Aqdus Muhammad Mustafa Sarsar what a wonderful person he was. He simplified the issue so wonderfully that one is left wondering why me stupid self did not think of this answer before. He said, Ma, ma ana uh, alayhi wa ashabi. You can, you can recognize that set by finding out whatever is happening to that set if the condition, the state of that sect is similar to my state and of those who are following me he has to be the right sect if his state is similar to my opponents and my ho those hostile to me he has to be the wrong sect so can't you recognize light when you see it as against darkness where is the big difficulty in finding out the right sect from the wrong you imagine me bring my, uh, uh, I mean the state from which I am passing and the state from which my sahaba, my companions are passing into your mind and immediately you apply that picture to the sects, whoever confirms to that picture is the right sect. So 
Ma'ana alayhi wa ashabi is now the question which precipitated to this. How do we find where stood Hazur Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his followers? We can find it in two ways. One again, that tricky, devious way of reaching the truth through academic study. Ahur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held certain views. If you begin, open up the debate of those views again and try to find out the views of all the sects and their beliefs and then judge whether according to you they are according to Hazur Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's views and, uh, and doctrines or not the same Pandora's box is opened again. You have not gained anything from this statement of Ahur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he could not have meant that. What he meant was what was happening to him and to his followers. If you know that, you must also recognize the sect which will go through the same conditions and the same treatment in the future time. That is to say, what is happening to me at the hands of my opponents, the same thing will happen to the followers of truth in the latter days. What was that? You know that. He was denied the right of calling himself a Muslim. Was he not? His followers were denied the right of declaring themselves to be Muslims. Hazrat Umar was so thoroughly beaten for the crime of declaring himself to be a Muslim that uh, when he declared it near Khana Kaaba, the opponents not only beat him but told him to declare himself to be a Sabi. He said, this is your name as we call you. You have no right to call yourself a Muslim. They were deprived the right of declaring Kalima. They were almost beaten to death. Don't you remember the history of Bilal? What was passing at that time to him? What was happening to him? Such cruelties were perpetrated against those who declared Kalima they said, you have no right to say kalima. <coughs> they were deprived the right of going to Mecca for performing pilgrimage, the Hajj. They were deprived to, to build mosques, to say azans, to do anything which was uh, enjoined upon them by the Holy Quran to do. These are the things which were happening to Ahazra sallallahu alayhi wa and his followers, were they not? And to whom are they happening today? If not to any of these, are they not? Each one of them, each one in every detail. Hundreds of Ahmadis were almost beaten to death in Pakistan only recently in these years of so-called enlightenment, just for the crime that they declared Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasul. Nobody could imagine that in this age this could happen. People had thought and that this was the thing of the past that would never repeat, that could never repeat. No Muslim before it started happening could believe that any Muslim could punish somebody for the crime of declaring the unity of God and the truth of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Could you imagine it before it happened? So the dark ages have come back upon you. And those who are behaving like the opponents of Ahazar sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how could you say they are in the right? If you say that, then you are in the wrong. Because then the opponents of Huzur Akram and his followers are just alike, then there is no difference. So when you begin to behave in the way that people behave to Ahazar sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his opponents I mean, then whatever your claim, whatever your profession, whatever your belief, one thing is certain that you can, cannot be in the right. If you are treated like the followers of Ahadur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were treated and he himself was, then no sane man can declare such a people to be in the wrong. Because their treatment shows, and this is not their own act of fabrication. Such treatment comes from their enemies. They don't like this treatment. Willy-nilly this is the treatment which is meted out to them. So this is question which you have raised is a very potent question. Please. <coughs>
you would allow me, there is a saying, make this matter very decisive. The same one. Yes. Uh, that companion asked Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that uh, supposing that there was not a Jama'ah and Imam, yes. what would I do with that time? Yes. We all know that know now that all Muslim people, yes, yes. especially in the Arab countries, right. don't claim that they belong to Jama'at. But they claim that they are right. Yes, quite right. But the answer of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when he when the companion asked him, suppose that there was no Jama'at and no Imam. What shall do? Muhammad said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, You have to leave all the other all of those for He said it is better for you to forsake all interest in life and retreat. Even if yes. you yes. bite on a piece of branch of tree وَتَعْتَزِلْ فُرَقَ كُلَّهَا For your survival, that's right, yes. right, right, right. Which proves that if a person knows that he doesn't belong to a jama'at, he must be sure that he is not right. He is wrong. Either he, that or that, he must wait for the right to appear. Yes, that's I mean their claim being right and accusing us of being wrong. <laughs> is answered by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Exactly, that's right. That because they, are, they don't belong yes, to Jama'at. Yes, I understand the impact, of the, the, the import of that tradition also is very important for us. You are quite right, I agree with you. You know, the, the declaration made by Ahadur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more important feature of that declaration is that a time would come when Imam Rabbani would not be present. A, an Imam sent by God will not be present. Now, these other sects, they believe themselves to be, the, to be in the right, yet they also believe that their head of the sect, of, first of all there is no one head of the sect. There are hundreds of heads of each sect. Some follow some and some follow the others. But even if they were from, there was one head of, of a sect, they yet would believe that he is not an Imam created by God. Yes. This is the state. That's, that's why they exactly, are not Jama'at. Exactly. This is more, very important. <laughs> the only Jama'at among the Muslims today which believes in the totality of our, the Holy Quranic teachings and the totality of Azra Sallallahu's injunctions with an Imam is Jama'at Ahmadiyya. There are some other fake Jamaats as well which may sort of confuse the issue for a beginner, for a man of a cursory examination. Someone may point out that, uh, uh, for instance, um, um, there are Baha'is, for instance, Now they, they don't no longer claim to be Muslims, but at the time there was when they claimed to be Muslims. They had a Jama'ah and they had a, an Imam. There are two Imams in fact. One of them claimed to be sent by God. So they may, may have claimed that this is the similarity again. So what is the difference between Jama'at Ahmadiyya and that Jama'ah? Also, there are uh, um, Ismailis for instance. They have an Imam and a Jama'ah. And they also claim that their Imam is the Imam appointed by God. There is Jamaat Islami but their Imam is not appointed by God. They also say so that I don't bring them into the same bracket. So there are three now claimants according to this tradition you have quoted. Mm -hmm. Jamaat Ahmadiyya, the, the Ismailis and the Baha'is. What Ahazat sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was said in the tradition, the first tradition which I have quoted, ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. That is to say the future imam or jama'a would not different, differ a jot from my teachings and the teachings of the Holy Quran. So if anybody claims to be an imam and yet claims that a part of the Holy Quran has been cancelled out, or a saying of the tradition Ahazar Sallallahu is no longer in effect in, in operation then that Jama'ah and that Imam ceases to claim the right to be to be 
declared that jamaat and that, that imam of which you are talking now. In, in the cases of these two jamaats, that is jamaat uh, Ismaili and jamaat Baha'is, this is exactly true. That Ismailis no longer believe in all the traditions of Ahadrat Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, they don't call their mosques mosques. They don't pray like the Ahadrat Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did pray. Instead of prayer, they, a place of prayer and worship, they call it Jamaat Khana. And in Jamaat Khanas, a picture of their uh, uh, head of the community is uh, hung in, in front towards Qibla or to wherever uh, they face in that Jamaat Khana. And they pray to him. So they are out of the uh, competition immediately. So many other dif <coughs> fundamental differences are found in their beliefs and habits that you can't say they are for the followers, entire followers, without any difference of the Holy Quran and of the traditions of Ahadur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As far as the Baha'is are concerned, this is not uh, 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 a known fact about them, no debate about it. They themselves claim that the Holy Quran is an obsolete book and a change was required. This is why this movement was started. So they also do not fall into that category. The only contestant, the only claimant left in the field is Jamaat Ahmadiyya. Yes, I mean, for the, the majority of the Jamaat, yes. uh, of the Muslims, I mean, they know that they don't claim to be Jamaat. Yes. And they don't claim that they have had any bayat. This is yes. also... The majority the does. That, yes. yes, exactly. And I we know that it is very decisive that yes. the Muslim should have bayat. I, 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 I fully agree, but what I wanted to point out that you should modify your position when you say that in future. Otherwise, one day you will be confronted with a question: yes, of What course, about Ismailis yes, and yes. what about Baha'is yes. and so on that's and so really forth? Yes. So only that is the reason why I pointed out to this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I fully agree with you. Yes. <laughs> So, shall, shall we ultimately <laughs> permit Mr. Abdul Rashid? Huh? You have already surrendered. All right. You also surrender? No, no, it's up, up to you and up to the rest of us. From Surat Moment. Yes. Uh, that's good. Would you kindly explain? Well, I'll read the verse first. Could you kindly explain why it is not mentioned in the Holy Quran that we gave Torah to Moses? Yes, the, I think you have been sitting um, with the Holy Quran, Chakravi, quite often, haven't you? Uh, this, is a, this is a very favorite question of Chakravi in Holy Quran that uh, they have discovered that Torah as such has, been not, has not been mentioned with reference to Hazrat Moses. Allah and Kitab has been related to Hazrat Moses but not Torah. <coughs> but they forget that Torah itself has been declared to be Al-Kitab. And Torah has not been referred as Torah as a leading book for the uh, followers of Hazrat Moses till the time of Hazrat Masih but the book of Moses has been referred to as such so when you read the refer cross references to the same subject you have to come to, come to the conclusion that Torah is the book which has been mentioned in reference to Hazrat Moses and the book is Torah and they are one and the same thing Otherwise, it would pose a very grave problem to us. If Torah was not revealed to Moses, to whom it was revealed? And what authority it held over the prophets? And who was that prophet to whom this book was revealed? This question remains unsolved. And why was not the name 
was was not a name given to the book of Hazrat Moses al Musa And if a name was not given to his book, yet we are told in the Holy Quran that it was his book which was to be followed by the latter prophets and the form and the followers of, of that religion for many centuries to come. Then why shouldn't it suffice? Why to bring in the question of Torah and where would it stand in relation to the that book? That is one way of solving this issue. And the other way is go to the Old Testament itself. Take out the five books which are which fall under the heading of Torah and produce one book which was revealed to Moses. Which was that? None. So in historical perspective, in references, various references to this question by the Holy Quran, you can only come to one conclusion and one alone, that the book which is mentioned in the Holy Quran to have been revealed to Moses was no other book than Torah. And Torah was the collection of the, those teachings which were uh, referred to as the Moses al Yet, why the word Torah is not used? In reference to Moses remains a question as far as the philosophy of this attitude of Allah is concerned. I have reason to believe that it conveys a message to us. Torah has been interpolated so much. The books under the title Torah as we find them today have been interpolated so much <coughs> that uh, only part of it is Allah's word which was revealed to Moses and part of it is just human innovation. So much so that even Torah mentions that after this Moses the servant of God died. You know, relating an historical event. So much of history has been added to the revelation of Moses that uh, it has become a confused issue. So when Allah referred to Al-Kitab having in reference to Moses, which means that that Al-Kitab remains is not exactly to be tallied with the Torah of the present day. You understand the point? The word Torah could be applied only to the teachings of Moses. And Al-Kitab, a nameless Al-Kitab was given to him, which in fact consists, consisted of the two teachings which were revealed to Moses. But if Torah as such was declared to have been revealed to Moses, there might have been some confusion in the minds of some Muslims that it contains so much of rot, so much of absurdities, that it's impossible for it to be the word of God. So maybe when Torah is not used, applied, the word Torah is not applied to Al-Kitab, that is the reason. But then if you solve this like this, another question will evolve automatically, which will come up automatically. All right, when the Allah speaks of Torah in good terms, in another place, not with that reference to death directly to Moses, why does Allah praise the same Torah which uh, uh, he in a way by keeping silence condemns in other places? That question will remain unsolved. So I weighed all these things in my mind and uh, I am not very really sure so myself of what is the answer to this second objection. But I am still inclined to believe that as far as the word Torah is used by the Holy Quran is concerned, that is again in reference to the true teachings. But it is not referred to Moses because, as I said, the Moses books was interpolated and under Torah, the five books which are mentioned nowadays, are not all that was revealed to Moses. But also I have another possibility in mind and this I have not yet investigated fully. So I am just 
expressing it as a loud thinking. Don't take it as a verdict from me. I have a possibility in mind that would follow us ultimately that the present books of Torah may have contained some revelations to other prophets, prophets other than Moses, and that teaching would have been intermingled under under Torah. If that is the case, then Torah becomes a good book as such, less the interpolations which have been mentioned in the Holy Quran. But it would not be a book revealed entirely to Moses. It would be a book comprising the revelation of Moses plus the revelation of some other lesser prophets of the time. Again, maybe it is possible that. Allah also spoke to Hazrat Harun. It is not essential that he spoke exactly in the same words to Hazrat Harun as to Hazrat Moses the Lesser Atosna. Otherwise, it will be a useless repetition. It is just possible, and it should be so that as far as the fundamentals of the teachings are concerned, they were given to Moses, but also. Allah spoke to Harun because he had appointed him his prophet, and he could not be a prophet unless unless Allah came into communion with him, into dialogue with him. And the so-called Torah contains that those references as well. So to be technically correct, if Allah had mentioned that we revealed Torah to Moses, then Harun would be totally left out of Torah. It would not be correct. But as far as the book, that is, the book is a very important word here. The book is a terminology of the Holy Quran, a term of the Holy Quran, which means a a revelation of God relating to do's and do nots. That is Sharia, the law. So uh, from that we can safely infer. If I am right, as I, I told you in the beginning that. After thinking aloud, what I have told you, I have come to the conclusion that this seems to be the last one which I am telling you. This seems to be the ultimate point of escape for us from this dilemma. That Allah wanted to point out that whatever is covered under Torah is not entirely the teachings of Moses, that is Al Kitab. But also some of that which was revealed to Harun or some of the prophets, maybe, has been contained in this book. <laughs> But when Allah speaks of the law, then the law was given entirely to Moses and to none other. So because Torah contains a part, something apart from the law, so it was not said that Torah is revealed to Moses, but it was always said Al Kitab was revealed to Moses. Alwah was given to him. You understand? As far as I am concerned, this last explanation satisfies me to a, a, to a measure. But I have to further investigate into this matter until I find a sharp final conclusion. So you tricked me into a longer answer <laughs> than I intended. <laughs> I want to see you, Inshallah. Please pray for me. But before that, you must be uh, very uh, highly well versed in Arabic. Well, Allah has been speaking very nicely. Because when I speak to Arabs and I teach them, Allah has been. I know Allah has you. And it's very satisfactory. They say. Can you can you put in your promise to them? The next time I come. I would, I would have mastered Arabic language. It's now that it's half mastered. What they are expecting is half mastery. No, no, they are not half mastery. You know, there was about mastery. There was a friend of mine, a fellow student of mine, the, when we, I was studying in Government College. He had a very unique way of expressing him to himself. Sometimes it happened that he said, "I asked him, 'Do you are you certain of this?'" He, the answer would always be, "Perhaps I'm certain." <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Yeah.